All right. Uh, happy Wednesday, everybody. Before we start, let me welcome a couple of visitors in the back there from the office of the spokesperson of the Ethiopian Foreign Ministry. You are most welcome. If you'd like a job, no, I haven't. <laughs> um, all right. Um, the secretary, as you saw, has been very active out in the press. We had the global town hall yesterday and some TV interviews, and then obviously she had the employee town hall today that all of you were able to see. So I think we've taken care of most of the business, don't you? We can keep this kind of quick and short. Well, sure, but there are right. some other things going on in the world. As, as the secretary did note, <clears throat> she did. things go on even though she is leaving. Um, let's start with um, uh, Syria, and in particular Israel and Syria. Um, what do you know about uh, this airstrike that the Israelis conducted inside Syria? Uh, I don't have any comment for you at all on those reports. I am sorry about that, but I don't. Anything else on Syria while we're on Syria? Um, can we talk about the, um, the new warnings that have been coming out about the levels of violence in Syria? I think Special Envoy Brahimi yesterday said that the war has reached unprecedented levels of horror. And uh, today the Syrian opposition is actually taking to task um, global inaction over what's happening in Syria and uh, basically saying that um, the international community is giving the regime a license to kill. How would you characterize those comments? Well, certainly you know that yesterday uh, UN Joint Special Envoy Brahimi briefed a closed session of the Security Council. I think you saw Ambassador Rice had some comments after that session. And he gave a very frank and very grim assessment of the situation, both inside Syria and for the region. He again uh, offered six guiding principles based on Geneva the Geneva Agreement that the Security Council countries and Syria's neighbors reached way back in June for how a peaceful political transition could go forward if the Security Council countries could unite behind it. As you know, this is the same basis that we've been using for working with the Syrian uh, opposition coalition in preparing them for uh, the day after. Um, his assessment underscores what we have long said, that the longer this conflict goes on, the more difficult it's going to be, the more people are going to die, and the more um, difficult it's going to be to institute a stable political transition to preserve uh, the institutions of the Syrian state and the greater uh, potential for regional destabilization. So we share his grim and difficult assessment. Would, would you agree with the opposition assessment that, um, that there has been global inaction um, about what's happening in Syria? Well, you know our view. You know how hard we've been working to uh, keep a global uh, coalition of support for the Syrian people together, whether it has been in tightening sanctions that countries have on the Assad regime, which are pinching him and making it harder for him to fuel his military machine. Those sanctions are not complete because there are countries that are still supporting him and they know who they are. Uh, but we are continuing to work across the globe with countries to do what they can to cut off his supply of, of money and, and other things. You know what we are doing to support the Syrian opposition, both in terms of training them, helping them to be unified, helping them to uh, represent the broadest possible coalition of Syrians who want change from every walk of life, both inside and outside. And you know what we've been doing on the humanitarian side, including the additional assistance that we uh, that the President announced a couple of days ago. So we are doing what we can, uh, and we will continue to do so with our, with our partners. But there are countries out there that are not leaning on Assad as much as they could, and we will continue to try to urge them to use the influence that they have. Please. Sorry, those are the same, the usual suspects? The usual suspects, please. But can you name them? Uh, well, we're certainly, we, we remain concerned about, as the Secretary has said, and she said quite clearly in her town hall yesterday and in some of her interviews, uh, about the fact that even though we have um, public statements coming from Moscow that they know Assad is going, they continue uh, to fulfill military contracts, they continue to provide him with other kinds of support. So that's concerning. Obviously, we're all concerned about the fact that uh, Iran is basically his, his uh, co-fighter now, so please. Uh, the last three B's meeting discussed some ideas and there was, uh, the, the three B's were about to come back with, after consulting with their governments. 
Anything new on that? Well, the way we left it was that when uh, Joint Special Envoy Brahimi thought that it was timely for another meeting and when he thought we could make some progress, we were prepared to have another meeting. He hasn't yet uh, asked for uh, a third session, so we stand ready when he does. What Brahimi discussed with uh, Burns and Bogdanov, were those six guiding principles? Uh, well, again, I don't think it's helpful to get into the details of the three B's conversation, but you know that uh, essentially his approach has been to try to take the language on the page of Geneva and talk about how it could be implemented in practice and try to have UN, US, Russian agreement about how to take that forward. So that's been the vector of work, if you will. Uh, please. What on. is the sticking point right now in, in these discussions to implement the Geneva uh, Agreement, the most sticking pressing uh, issue? Well, I think that um, Joint Special Envoy Brahimi has been clear that we have to move beyond the words on the page to actually how to implement them, and that's been something that's been difficult to agree on. Michelle? Yeah, uh, Syria's opposition leader, Muaz al Khatib, has offered today to hold talks with the Assad regime if the government releases political prisoners. Do you encourage him to do so? Well, again, in the context of the Geneva framework, uh, that does envision. Uh, a broad group of Syrians from all walks of life, from all uh, political um, uh, streams to sit down together, assuming that the group was mutually agreed on. So uh, what he's proposing is certainly consistent with uh, what's in the Geneva document. That, as you know, we have long called for and long supported UN and Arab League and uh, international calls for all political prisoners to be released. So let's see what how the regime uh, uh, responds. But the, the national, uh, Syrian National Council has rejected the move and they uh, said that uh, negotiating uh, or he refused to negotiate with a criminal regime, as uh, they said. Well, again, the Syrian opposition is itself going to have to continue to um, articulate how it sees taking forward a transition and who it would be willing to work with. We have continued to call on them to be as united and as broad-based broad as possible, but we're obviously not going to get in the middle of conversations that Syrians are having with each other about how to move forward. Please, Thank go you. on. One of the uh, part of the transition process for a Syrian coalition to create transition government, uh, the, does the U.S. government support uh, creation of a government by the Syrian coalition? <laughs> Again, it's up to the Syrian op opposition coalition to come up with its own roadmap for getting to the political transition that it has called for, that it envisions. So I'm not going to get into step A should be this and step B should be that. What we're interested in seeing is maximum unity, maximum inclusiveness, including across the ethnic and regional spectrum in Syria and the guarantee that we are all working for, that they are working for a Syria that is democratic, that is inclusive, that is pluralistic, uh, where there will be no reprisals, where um, the, the human rights of all Syrians are going to be protected because it's the best way to uh, pull off people who are continuing to support Assad. Do you think Syrian opposition on the ground still uh, have the momentum? How, how do you assess the situation on the ground militarily fighting? Uh, well, we have been clear that we have seen gains from the Syrian opposition. You know how much territory they now control, but clearly uh, the fighting remains pitched, particularly in and around Damascus and some of the outlying towns and uh, concerns, obviously, about Aleppo and other big population centers. Is this still, uh, could you explain um, what the reluctance is still to um, perhaps try and tip the balance on the ground and give um, weapons directly to the, uh, to the Syrian opposition? I mean, this is nearly two years of war, 60,000 people dead. Every day we're seeing horrible images of bodies being dragged out of river, rivers. I mean, if, if, you, if the United States could help tip the balance, why, why won't it do it? Uh, Joe, I'm going to send you back to some of the comments that the Secretary made yesterday, both in her uh, town hall interview, in her uh, global town hall, and on some of the TV uh, stations that she sat with yesterday. 
as well as the comments that the president made in his interview with the New Republic. Uh, in these situations, we always have to weigh uh, whether U.S. action is going to lead to peace or is going to lead to uh, an exacerbation of the violence. And these are the things that we have to weigh, and it's in that context that we uh, continue to provide non-lethal support, and, but we are staying in that category now. Well, of course, so we also have to weigh the consequences of inaction? Obviously, but the, I think if you look at the Secretary's comment, she, she gives a sense of the balance yeah. there. Can, Dima? Well, I just want to go back Sorry. to, uh, well, if it's still on Syria. No, no, I I, I, this okay. is just uh, brief, <laughs> briefly, just back to my first question, and it's not directly related to any strikes that may have happened mm -hmm. or not. But are you, does the administration, is the administration concerned that even as this fight, even as the government is basically imploding, that it is still shipping uh, materiel arms ammunition to Hezbollah? Uh, you know, we have been concerned about that relationship between Syria and Iran for a long time, between Syria and Hezbollah for a long time. It's clearly a codependent relationship. I'm not going to no, get I'm, into the details of what we're seeing. But even in these dire, even in the straits that the government, that the Syrian government finds itself in now, fighting this rebellion, essentially collapsing, as people think, um, are, are you still concerned that they are that they are supplying or helping to facilitate supplies to Hezbollah? Uh, Matt, I don't think I can get into that level of detail without being taken into intelligence. Let me simply say that uh, we remain concerned about this relationship, about the relationship of the Syrian regime, uh, not only to uh, Iran but also to Hezbollah, and we have for some time. Please, Dima. Can I ask about the U.S.-Russian thing? Uh, the bilateral agreement on counter narcotics cooperation. There is some kind of uh, ambiguity about all this. The Russian government announced pulling out of it, saying that it's essentially outdated uh, and no longer needed because Russia is switching from being the uh, aid recipient to the uh, donor state. Uh, the federal, the Russian Federal Drug Control Service, the FSKN, announced further announced that there is actually a new agreement in the works, and the, the bilateral relationship in this sphere is quote unquote on the rise. I wanted to hear your take on that. What, what, uh, what's going on? Dima, I couldn't quite hear you. So the Russian entity that's announcing a new agreement was was whom? A f a federal Service on Drug Control, the F FSKN. Uh huh. Uh, well, let me first uh, confirm what Dima has, which is that the Russian government has notified us of their decision to terminate our agreement on law enforcement cooperation and narcotics control. Uh, we are seeking more clarification from the Russian government at the moment with regard to what they see this covering. Uh, we obviously uh, regret this decision because under our agreement we've had very fruitful cooperation with Russia on rule of law, counter-corruption uh, counter efforts, preventing trafficking in persons, uh, counter-narcotics, and strengthening our mutual legal assistance uh, cooperation. We obviously remain committed uh, to working on these and other mutually beneficial law enforcement issues with the Russian Federation, for example, on interdicting narcotics. Uh, I can say that we do still have in force a mutual legal assistance treaty. We have uh, cooperation in uh, DEA channels, so perhaps that's what your authorities were, or Russian authorities were referring to. Sorry, still have in place at this moment. At the rate the Russians are pulling out of agreements with you guys, it might not be too long before there are none. This is the third. Yeah, in, 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 in less than a year? Uh, it is, and, you know, I would say that, um, you know, from our perspective, uh, the Secretary spoke about how self-defeating we thought it was to end the AID cooperation agreement because uh, the, our AID programs in Russia did things like um, help tackle the tuberculosis problem, help tackle AIDS, help with public health, all these kinds of things. I think from our perspective, this is also self-defeating because most of the work we were doing under this agreement uh, was also involved in training Russians, training them on uh, trafficking in persons, uh, interdiction, training them on implementation of the mutual legal assistance treaty that we have, 
uh, training them in implementation of their own new criminal procedures code, which was something that they sought our help on and we helped them work on. So how to implement that was something that uh, we were working on, but it's obviously a Russian decision if they don't feel they need that help anymore. Right, but I mean this is so you got AID, you got the adoptions, now you have this. How's that reset going? Well, look, I mean, I think the Secretary also spoke uh, to this yesterday, that we have um, a range of, of challenging issues here, and we're going to have to continue to work through them. But that doesn't change the fact that when we do work together, when we can cooperate, whether it's bilaterally or whether it's in the international realm, uh, it, it helps uh, both of us and is in our mutual interest, as it has been uh, in concluding the New START Treaty, as it has been when we work together on Afghanistan, as it has been in our P5 plus one work on Iran. So, um, you Syria. know, we have to, and, but, Not on Syria. but where we have differences, we're going to be straight up about them. We've been straight up about them with regard to Syria, with regard to territorial integrity of, okay. yeah. On this uh, specific, the, the law enforcement thing, and you said you were, I, I think you said, and I just want to make sure you were looking for some clarity on why? Uh, no, we were looking for some clarity on what they consider covered by by this and what they are actually looking so for. So what would remain? Correct. What areas of cooperation? Correct. Sorry. A short, short, short follow-up to yeah. that. Was it something completely unexpected to you or they told you, you know, some time ago that, guys, you'd better be aware that we're going to do that? Uh, my understanding is this came up uh, just in this, just this week. Yeah. It would be, it would be helpful <laughs> if maybe someone could find... Um, with the Russia, Russia desk or whoever handles these things to see how many agreements there are with Russia that they have the ability to unilaterally withdraw from. Uh, you mean how many of these kinds of bilateral yeah. agreements? And let us uh, do a little bit more work on uh, all of the, you know, we, we have quite a uh, web of things lot, under the Bilateral Presidential Commission. So. Does it affect any number of staff? Do you have staff who are actually um, deployed for this in Moscow for this particular program? Uh, I'm sure that we have trainers under this under this program who will be affected. It's about uh, two million dollars worth of training. Yeah, um, I'm wondering if you have any more clarity or detail you can share with us about the transition that will take place and when exactly Senator Secretary Kerry will be sworn in officially. Uh, well, as you know, Secretary Clinton has announced that uh, Friday will be her last day. Um, we also understand that Secretary-designate Kerry will be sworn in on Friday afternoon. Um, my understanding is that he has asked uh, Justice Kagan to swear him in. He knew her well from the Clinton White House and from Massachusetts, and that his first day here in the mothership, State Department Maine, will be on Monday. And do you know what he'll be doing for his first week yet? Uh, I'm sure when we have schedule information to share, we will share it as we usually do. It's slightly off training question, but what if some, um, God forbid, but what if some huge crisis erupts over the weekend? Well, as I said, uh, he is expected to be sworn in on so Friday he would, he would afternoon. Deal, he, would, yeah. he would deal with it. He would Seamless be Seamless transition. Right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Please, Mr. Lee. The building? Uh, he's going to he's going to be sworn in in a in a private, small swearing in ceremony that Justice Kagan will preside over. Please. I, I, I want to continue to see you at the podium. Is that going to be possible? <laughs> <laughs> Can we stick with that just for one second? Yes. In terms of the, just the mechanics of the yes. transition, just, as soon as he's sworn in, does that mean he has DS protection? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, Matt. I would assume so, but I will check on that for you if, and, if it's of interest. And then uh, over the, just over the weekend. Um, I mean, even in case he, you need to call him, or even something? yeah, no. Uh, well, should I call him or Bill Burns? That's my question. I mean, even even if he hadn't been sworn in over the weekend, it's not as if there's it's rudderless in this building. I mean, there are people who are in senior positions who are staying. No, obviously there's a lot of continuity, but uh, <laughs> my understanding is that he will be sworn in on Friday afternoon and will thereafter be the Secretary of State. Please, well, Catherine. you said it was a private ceremony on Friday. Mm -hmm. As folks in the media were interested in, will we be seeing that, or will there be a more public swearing in? Uh, I don't have any more information on that. If we uh, get it, we will share it. Please, Mr. Lee. Actually, I, I was going to ask you about Korea. Mm -hmm. South Korea succeeded, succeeded in its uh, space rocket launch. 
uh, there is some concern that it may add fuel to regional arms race. In the Liga, do you have any response to South Korea's move? Uh, well, we can confirm because we were observers that uh, the Republic of Korea has successfully launched a research satellite on January 30th uh, from its narrow uh, space center. Uh, you know our view that there is no basis for comparing the behavior of the ROK in space with the behavior of the DPRK. DPRK obviously is completely prescribed under binding UN Security Council resolutions from uh, based on its ballistic missile activity from any kind of launching, uh, whereas the ROK uh, has developed its space launch program uh, completely responsibly. It's an active member of international nonproliferation agreements and regimes, and it has implemented broad guidelines uh, on the possession and development of uh, missile and rocket technology. So, Tria, does, does the State Department regard North Korea as a member of uh, global space club? Uh, I don't know what the definition of that is, but you know how concerned we are about any uh, launch or any activity that involves ballistic missile technology. Well, and, and this, this launch did, the South Korean launch did involve ballistic missile technology, correct? Again, but as no, I, I understand, yes. I understand that it's that, that, that the North Koreans aren't allowed to do it because of the UN, the UN restrictions. And I understand that the South Koreans are, but my question is, if you see, and the South and the Japanese and everyone else, or almost everyone else, sees a North Korean ballistic missile activity as a threat, why shouldn't the North Koreans see ballistic missile activity by the South as a threat? Well, without getting into all of the technical details here, which I'm not equipped to do, uh, suffice to say that, as I said at the outset, the ROK participates actively in the full range of international nonproliferation sure. activities so that everybody knows exactly what they're doing with the technology that they have. They follow very clear protocols for safeguarding it, for ensuring it's not proliferated, uh, and for making sure that the world can see the way they deal with it and that there's no uh, military intent or military program. So that is completely different than the way the DPRK well, well, behaves. Well, my question is not the difference in how they behave, is why the North shouldn't see this as a threat. The North shouldn't see it as a threat because they too can enjoy the same transparency with regard to the program that the rest of us have, which is a far cry from the way the DPRK itself behaves. Okay. Okay. All right, so it's a transparency issue. And then again, in the beginning you said it was a successful launch. Uh, that is our understanding. And, 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 and the North Koreans' last launch was successful or not by your... Um, I don't actually have an evaluation on that right. one way or the other. But I send well, you to NASA. It turns out that it was, you know, it, it looks like the satellite died up in space. And uh, I, I frankly don't think I ever saw a final determination, okay. but NASA... Well, anyway, but, but, well, every time the North has tried to do this, they've failed, um, which means that the th any threat that there might have been is, is, is diminished, right? Because they're not very good at what they are trying to do. Um, so I think we would reject that, Matt. They are continuing to pursue and try to perfect their ability to use this stuff, which they shouldn't be involved in at all, given the sanctions. Can we go to the back there? Lady in turquoise. Uh, on North Korea and um, fears that a nuclear test is imminent, um, is it too early to find out what the State Department is looking to do in response to um, a nuclear test, which looks increasingly likely um, new sanctions to the Security Council, new uh, domestic sanctions? What kind, of, what kind of things are going on there? The uh, Secretary spoke to this one as well yesterday. Uh, I don't have anything further to say than what she said, which was we made clear in Resolution 2087 that there'd be further consequences, and uh, we fully intend to keep uh, to that. Please. Related to Latin America. Yeah. The U.S. is following this uh, harsh exchange between Israel and Argentina that happened yesterday, where uh, the Israelis uh, called the Argentinian ambassador in, in Israel to give explanations, and the Argentinians gave a statement say, saying that this is a, an intromission of Israel in their foreign affairs related to their agreement with Iran. 
Is there a question in there? The somewhere? question is the U.S. is following this this harsh uh, in exchange uh, between uh, Israel and Argentina yesterday. Well, we're obviously watching it, if that's what you're asking. And so the question is, are are you uh, also cons uh, having the same? You sharing the same concerns that Israel is saying that this is all this uh, all this commission will final fi finalize in a trap that finally will uh, wash I Iran Im image and this is not going to go anywhere. That, that how, how which is the, the U.S. view on this? Uh, well, I spoke to this a little bit on uh, what day was it? Would have been Monday, and I don't think yeah. I have anything further on it. Dima, no. again? I don't. Dima? Uh, uh, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Uh, the, the Israelis were, at least some Israelis have told me, that they were not too happy with the response that you gave on Monday. Um, they thought that they, they, they thought that you actually left the door open to saying that this might actually be a good idea, this Truth Commission. With the, with uh, I didn't speak to the Truth Commission at all. I simply said that we believe the Iranian government has a responsibility to cooperate f fully with Argentine authorities in seeing that the perpetrators are okay. brought to justice. Well, I could, didn't comment either way okay, on the Truth well Commission. You, could, you, could you comment on the Truth Commission and what the U.S. thinks about it? Uh, I don't think we're going to have any comment on the particular vehicle, but I will take it and see if anybody uh, wants I, I, to come back on it. I have your question. Yeah. If in this International Truth Commission, Imagine that the U.S. Is, is called to cooperate. Do you think the U.S. can cooperate also in this international? Again, commission? you're taking me into all kinds of hypotheticals about something that's been announced, but we haven't seen it uh, implemented. Okay. I think you said, sorry, on the truth question, I think you said you'll have to, if the Argentinians think it's a good idea, you have to see where it will go. Uh, I will go back and look and see what I have, but I will also see if we have any further uh, to say to and Matt's question. It seems to be a, an issue of, of, of very big concern in Israel, um, and the, the suggestion was being made that somehow the administration wasn't standing by its ally by not taking a strong position against the formation of this uh, of this Truth Commission. Well, let me, let me see if we have anything further to say, but it's certainly our view and it has been our view since this bombing 18 years ago that the Iranians ought to be brought to account. Please. I wanted to ask about uh, press reports about the appointment of Ambassador Dan Fried, uh, new sanctions co coordinator for the State Department. Uh, should it be seen as a new focus on sanctions as a one tool of the foreign policy in the U.S.? Well, I think you know that we have... To create this, you know, this past. Well, certainly you know that whether they are multilateral sanctions under the UN Security Council or whether they are national sanctions. We have for decades uh, employed sanctions where we think they can be helpful in pursuit of our policy goals, usually in conjunction with other tools of diplomacy. Uh, I think uh, without getting too far into it, the concern was that we've got uh, pieces of sanctions in many different pieces of legislation. They affect many different relationships uh, around the world, and that it was time, rather than doing this on a regional basis, to centralize the way we looked at how we implement sanctions. There's not only the question of ensuring that we are following the letter and the spirit of international law and American law. There's also the question of when it's time to retire sanctions that are no longer useful. Um, to uh, look again at policies that may not be working. You'll recall that in the context of our step-by-step -step approach to Burma, uh, a number of U.S. sanctions have been suspended. So the idea here was to create a single office with maximum experience uh, on sanctions and to follow both implementation of, of sanctions, new sanctions, and relief of sanctions. Follow-up question, please. This. So is Dan Freeman handling sanctions on North Korea too, like Bob Ayanon did? Uh, the idea here will be that all sanctions policy will come under Ambassador Freed. Uh, Bob Einhorn will continue his nonproliferation work. He'll continue his work on, uh, on Iran and DPRK and other things in that context. Uh, but the sanctions piece will, will be with Freed. Please. Uh, on Afghanistan, yeah. we have a question we had one day about uh, Afghanistan buying electricity from Iran. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything that you can share your thoughts on that? Well, let me say as a general point that uh, we have enco encouraged the government of Afghanistan, as we have all of our other partners, to look closely at existing U.S. sanctions and to ensure that any engagement that Afghanistan has with Iran 
uh, and any activities of Afghan companies doing business with Iran don't violate them. Um, and that would include, of course, transactions with the Central Bank of Iran or other designated organizations or transactions involving Iran's energy and petrochemical sectors, uh, which may be sanctionable. So that's the conversation that we will continue to have with Afghanistan to be sure that they don't fall afoul of U.S. or international law. Is it your assessment at present that they are not falling afoul of? Uh, we need to continue to have that conversation before I can make an assessment here. Please. Uh, but, uh, in North Korea, there was a report that a U.S. citizen detained in uh, North Korea met Swedish diplomat in North Korea. Can you confirm that? Uh, I had not heard that. I think you know that we had uh, one visit by our protecting power earlier on. Let me check if we've had another one. That would be a good thing. Please. On Egypt, mm -hmm. uh, Egypt army chief has warned yesterday that uh, Egypt's state could collapse do you take this warning into consideration? Well, again, here I'm going to point you back to uh, the extensive comments that the Secretary made yesterday on Egypt, both in the town interview and in her subsequent TV interviews. She made clear uh, the concerns that we have and our hope and expectation that the various groups in Egypt will come together in, uh, around a table and talk these things out, and the dialogue will be the answer rather than violence of any kind. And how do we view uh, al Baradi I called today for uh, talks with the regime? It's a good thing. It's a good thing that members of the opposition are agreeing to sit down for talks now. Instead of just talking the talk, everybody's got to walk the walk and sit around the table. Turkey? Yes. Egypt. Yep. Uh, do you have any comment regarding the the national dialogue, I mean, do you have any new writings on the walls that the people there can read it, beside what was said in the last 24 hours? Well, again, I think if you look back at what the Secretary had to say in the last 24 hours, she's spoken extensively about our hope to see the wishes of the Egyptian people uh, when they went into the square so long ago fulfilled through the way the government uh, takes the country forward. So we're looking to all sides to engage in a process of, of real democratic compromise. The government has a responsibility to help create that process. The opposition has a responsibility to engage in dialogue. That's what we want to see, so that the people of Egypt really uh, see a future that is truly democratic, where there is a lot of consensus about the way forward and where everybody feels like they have a voice and their rights are protected. In the last, let's say, 24 or 48 hours, is, is there any phone call was made or from secretary or anybody? Uh, not to my knowledge. I don't have, I don't think so. Uh, regarding the embassy there, is it still closed or it's working? Uh, I don't have a today update. I think uh, we mentioned on Monday that we closed early. Um, we will check on that for you. Get back to you. Please. Last time you were asked, Victoria, you said you did not see the remarks of Prime Minister Erdogan regarding the Shanghai Five. The reason I follow up with this question, the discussion didn't die down. It's still going on whether, you know, Turkey, uh, Prime Minister Erdogan's that statement. What's your reaction now? I'm sure you have seen the remarks by now. Um, frankly, I, I didn't catch up with it. I'm sorry, Thir. Uh, Ilhan. Yeah, go ahead. Well, then, does that Sorry. mean that you don't consider the Shanghai Cooperation Council to be a, uh, an important, uh, something of importance? Especially uh, just, if it means been... the Turks are going to turn their backs on Europe. There... And the Europeans have been turning their backs on the Turks for some time now. So, uh, Let me remind that uh, Turkey is a member of NATO, and that is their anchor in the transatlantic community. So. Uh, I don't think we have any indication that that's going to change. But uh, let me see if we have anything to say on that. On Mali, yeah. um, today the French, French troops have entered Kidal, which mm -hmm. was the last stronghold um, held by the um, I Islamic uh, militants. And uh, they seem to be meeting a, a fair amount, uh, a, 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 a lack of resistance, really. And I wondered if you could uh, talk to us about the situation on the ground and whether there's a fear that these... Um, extremist groups it could actually just be dispersing and heading into the hills and regrouping, and that actually the, it could take a lot longer to, to get rid of them. Uh, well, we obviously are, are pleased by the success that French and Malian forces have had and the retreat of the rebels and the extremists. Uh, we understand that French and Malian forces now control Timbuktu and Gao. The mayors of both of those cities who had fled to Bamako have come back to their respective cities and resumed 
work. And as you say, uh, we understand that French troops uh, are now at the airport in Kadal. Um, we uh, also understand that, the, that Malian officials have sent gendarmes into Gao and into Timbuktu to assure security. Uh, they've also made strong statements uh, against reprisals. And we echo the calls that Malians are making, that French are making, uh, urging uh, Malian private citizens to refrain from retaliating against Tuaregs or other ethnic minorities. We obviously condemn any attacks on civilians. Uh, we also support the calls from Malian officials and civil society leaders appealing for calm and their statements that there will be no uh, impunity for human rights abuses. Obviously, you point to the right next ta challenge, Joe, which is uh, not only to ensure that these cities that have been re regained and towns um, can be held, but that the international mission, the AFISMA mission, uh, moves in behind Malian forces and the French to stabilize northern Mali, to go after uh, the rebels where they have fled to and ensure that they can't come back and regroup. So uh, it's in that context that we welcome the fact that there are some uh, 1,400 um, Afisma country troops now in Mali from Nigeria, Benin, Togo, Senegal, Burkina Faso, and Chad. There are Nigerians on their way, and we are uh, continuing our efforts through our ACOTA training to uh, ensure sustainment training backfill for those forces as well. And is there any update on American aid to um, the ECOWAS forces or to the SFEMA? Uh, we announced yesterday that we intend to provide uh, subject to congressional notification, a total now of $96 million in support for AFISMA troops. I think on Monday I announced 40. We've now uh, notified Congress of an additional $50 million. Uh, $8 million has already been allocated to provide for basic logistical support for the initial ECOWAS contingents, including immediate transport uh, and equipment. Uh, five million will go to assist uh, formed police units that will start to deploy. These are ECOWAS country police units, not Malian police units. And uh, we've notified this additional um, money that will go for equipment, logistical support, and advisory support for AFISMA troops. Uh, I would also note, as you know, that there was a donors conference earlier this week run by the AU, uh, and uh, the Total funding pledged was some $455.5 million, so that is an excellent show of resolve by the international community. Big donors were the EU, the AU, Germany, Bahrain. And the um, Malian president is saying that he hopes to arrange elections by, by July 31st, which is actually slightly later than the timetable that, the, that you guys were hoping for. You were hoping for April. Does, what do you, what, what's your US comment on that? Well, we talked about this a little bit on Monday. We all obviously want to see these elections as soon as possible so that democracy can be restored. But we also have to appreciate that it, they can't be held until they are technically feasible. So we do note that the new Malian Assembly's roadmap uh, speaks about July. It will be important to meet that target in terms of security, et cetera. Please, Scott. Related. Is there now an agreement with Niger to base U.S. drones in Niger? Uh, well, I think you saw some statements that uh, we put out uh, yesterday making clear that after more than a year of work, we have now signed a status of forces agreement with the government of Niger. Um, I'm obviously not going to get into intelligence issues, but this enables us to work more closely in military to military channels and other channels with. Uh, the government of Niger on issues that we share concerns about. Obviously, uh, Mali is front and center, and we're working with them on this AFISMA deployment as well. Is this done in uh, connect with connection with the French, or it's only the U.S.? Well, obviously, we coordinate with the French in our, in our approach. The French, as you know, are focused on their activities in Mali and on the EU training mission for Malians as uh, we and other countries are focused on getting the ECOWAS forces up and in. Please. You earlier Nigerian forces. Are they from Nigeria or from Niger? No, we have Nigerian forces there, and we have Nigerians on their way. Yeah. All right. Victoria, American journalists 
awesome ties has been missing in Syria for over six months, and it has been a while that uh, we have heard from the U.S. State Department. Or do, do you have any any kind of update or anything that you have heard? Ilhan, uh, unfortunately, I do not. Scott in the back. Yeah, Thailand. Do yeah. you have anything on the <clears throat> uh, question I asked on Monday? The magazine editor who's received a ten-year prison sentence. He was found to be uh, insulting the monarchy. I do, I believe. Uh, we are deeply concerned by the criminal court's decision to sentence Mr. Pruksakasamaksak, I'm sorry I mangled his name, uh, to 10 years imprisonment for violating Article 112 of the Criminal Code and an additional year for a sentence that had previously been suspended. Uh, obviously, no one should be jailed for peacefully expressing their views. We regularly urge Thai authorities, both privately and publicly, to ensure that expression is not criminalized and freedom of expression is protected in accordance with Thailand's international obligations. Do you have anything on faster sentence than Iran? On um, uh, Abedini and yeah. um, we spoke to this a, a little while ago. Let me just see. I thought that I spoke to this yesterday, but uh, on Monday, did I not? But if, if not, let me. If there is anything. Yeah. There. We're obviously deeply disappointed that Saeed Abedini, who has been sentenced to eight years in prison in Iran on charges related to his religious beliefs. As we had said before, his attorney had had only one day to present his defense. So we're deeply concerned about the fairness and transparency of the trial. We condemn Iran's continued violation of the universal rights of freedom of religion and call on Iranian authorities to respect his human rights and release Mr. Abedini. We remain in close contact with his family. Um, thank you. Vietnam, there was mm -hmm. an American release. Do you have some good news? Do you have anything to say about that? I think I do. Uh, we're pleased that U.S. citizen Richard New has been released. Uh, we obviously have no higher priority than the safety and security of U.S. citizens abroad. As you know, our consulate authorities, uh, officials had visited him uh, monthly, but it is good news that he is now released. Anything else? Thank you all.